about the good night. This is about the good night Oppie um, documentary. Um, I got to watch this um, the night it was released in a watch party with some of my former colleagues. And we had a Zoom meeting where we could see people's reactions. And there were a lot of places in the movie where, where people were actually in tears. And it was so fun because we've, we've all gotten quite a bit older <laughs> since the mission began. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about the people. Um, Goodnight Oppie was pretty much an engineering centric documentary because a lot of that was, the filming was done at, at JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. And all of us worked there um, during the first three months of the mission because we thought it was gonna last 90 sols. And we said, okay, we'll all move out to Pasadena. They got us apartments um with blackout shades because we were working on mars time and many as as our shift started an hour approximately an hour later every day because we were working on mars time because the the rovers have solar panels and we have to do you know the rover does its work when the sun is up on mars so we had dark out shade blackout shades so that we would be able to more easily sleep in the daytime if that was where our shift was. Um, and then we thought, well, it'll probably be over in, in 90 sols if we make it that long, but then it didn't. So we, we went back to our home institutions, um, universities all over the world um, and all over the US, uh, Texas A&M, MIT, Harvard, University of Washington in St. Louis, um, various universities in Europe, um, Cornell, of course. Uh, and so we had to learn how to dial in and do our work remotely. But one of the miracles of this mission is that with a large science team of maybe, maybe 40 or 50 scientists, I'm not sure, everyone had a different interest, mineralogy, geology, uh, looking for traces of uh, previous life or water, um, atmospheric studies. And so th there are limited resources on the rover. And so every single day we would have what's called a science operations working group meeting where we would collectively decide what we were gonna do that day, what instruments we were going to use to examine the geology, where we were going to drive. And the miracle of it was that in an hour or less, every every Saul, we would reach consensus uh, without any uh, blood drawn or injuries. Um, everyone wanted to share the resources. Uh, we had limited downlink of how many images. We couldn't take all the pictures that we wanted to take. We had to select targets and we couldn't drive wherever we wanted to because it might not be safe. Uh, so every day we had a very congenial meeting and, and came to an agreement, um, maybe more easily than a real family would, but we did function as a family. So um, let me see if I can advance my slides. Uh, so this is a, this is actually a simulation of uh, spirit and opportunity. They were twins. And this uh, simulation was made by a student named Dan Moss uh, from Cornell. Some of you may know, I think his father was in the psychology department. So he did a simulation of, of the rover based on the actual drawings. Um, and at the top, you can see the panoramic cameras, the pan cam cameras uh, that we used. And they're up on a neck. And this, this robot is like a robotic geologist. And so the, the head, the camera head can swivel as if you were standing in place and turning around and looking around you. And also you can look up in the sky and down at the ground. And so when we operate the cameras, we have to decide where we're pointing geometrically and, and move that camera head and, and, take, and take the images. Um, and not we didn't always know where we were when we were pointing. So it was kind of challenging and exciting the next day to see, okay, did did we point it the right way? You know, are the images coming down okay? So it, there was a lot of, um, as Jennifer uh, Harris, uh, Jennifer Trosper said, she used to be Harris, she got married during the, the mission. She said, you know, her blood pressure went up during the mission. And I think 
uh, we all did. We were so invested in in success and not breaking anything that we always waited for the downlink to come down and is everything okay? Uh, and miraculously for many years it was. So this is a picture taken at, at JPL Jet Propulsion Lab in front of building 264 where we worked. And one day we 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 had to figure out a time when everyone could kind of show up who was living out there and also the resident JPL people. So we all got together for a big family photo. Um, just to mention a little bit of the, the sacrifices that people made, the people who live in Pasadena and work at JPL, they had to make a lot of adjustments for their families because it wasn't like dinner time was ever going to be the same every day or exist at all. And so they made a lot of sacrifices, you know, trying to adjust to family life and trying to get sleep when the rest of the family was awake. Those of us who parachuted in from other places, we kind of had it more easily, be, more easy because we were given apartments where we could be by ourselves and on our own schedule, but we still had the challenge of, okay, if, you, if you're starting your shift at five o'clock a.m., Mars time, what time is it on Earth and what should I sent, set my Earth alarm for? So it was this whole um, adjustment. And then if you wanna have food, everything isn't open in the middle of the night. So you have to plan ahead and, and bring some food or um, eventually the cafeteria was closed. So that eventually they started setting up like a little sandwich cart for people who were there in the middle of the night. And because the rovers were on the opposite sides of, of Mars, daytime for the two rovers was different. And so if you shift, changed from one rover to another, the other rover, then your whole time shift would, would change. And so we were basically jet lagged for, for the whole beginning of the mission, the first year of the mission. Um, and, and I know we were so excited about both rovers that when opportunity landed and spirit was already landed, everybody wanted to see what both rovers were doing, but it wasn't possible to stay up 24 hours a day. So people got pretty tired. Um, this is an actual wristwatch that um, Steve Squires got a jeweler in Montrose, California to take some Swiss army watches and calibrate the innards, the gears, so that they would be the same as Mars time. And so a lot of people were wearing two watches. This was before iPhones and cell phones. We had little flip phones that we were using. And so there were no apps to keep track of the time. So we had our Mars watches and then our regular watches and people wore two watches on their wrist. And then when it was, you look at the shift schedule and you'd, you'd see what it was in Mars time, and then you'd figure out an Earth time and set your your Earth alarm clock <laughs> to to get you to get you to the lab on time. And so I, I have one of these, probably would be worth a fortune on eBay someday. But the certificate of authenticity, I haven't wound it in a while. I should probably get it cleaned or something. Um, this is this is a picture of I don't know if you can see. Um, whoops. Let me go back. I think it's part of it's blocked out. I don't know if I can make this smaller. Let's see. There we go. Um, that's me in at JPL in in the camera room. You can see the Cornell banner. Um, the PanCam cameras were a Cornell um, production. Jim Bell was was the camera lead, and there were three of us from Cornell who who operated the cameras. Um, and we had, there were so many variables to set in, in each uh, image command that, that it spread across two screens, all the numbers. And so, um, you know, each, each line of 49 variables was, was one image. And so we had to figure out the pointing and the filters and the exposures and, and all that kind of thing. It, it was um, pretty amazing. We had a lot of software that we worked with. Um, this is a picture of me and Steve Squires at the Smithsonian. Um, we were invited to do um, an art opening of um, Mars images because they're actually very beautiful. Um, 
So we got we got the Smithsonian um, show, and at that point, that was I think 2013 or 14. I was in San Diego working on the Curiosity rover. I had gone out there um, to train their camera team for the because um, they were they were launching in 2012, and I moved out there to help them before launch, before landing. But I flew back to Washington for this show because it was just such an amazing thing. They blew up all the images huge and put them on the walls. And it was just really a wonderful experience. Um, so this is a picture. Um, Laureen, when we were walking the other day, asked me a question about um, in the movie, we see the rover on the surface, but how do how do you know? we get those images well those are actually simulations the picture the mars part of the pictures are real but what they do is they they scale an image of of the rover and put it in the scene as at the size and orientation that it would be but in this picture this is an actual picture of the surface of of um opportunity taken by the pan cam cameras. And that's why you can't see the masthead um, that, is, that is right there. And so what the camera does is it looks down at the deck and rotates all the way around and then raises the, raises the azimuth again and, and goes all the way around and takes a whole series of pictures. And then um, Jonathan Joseph at Cornell wrote software to um, stitch them all together into a, a panorama. So this is an actual real picture of opportunity on Mars. You can see its little Cal target in the back and it's um, high gain antenna and low gain antenna. And this is pretty early in the mission because the panels are very clean. Yeah. And so as time went on, the panels, solar panels got very dusty. But every once in a while, as they showed in the film, the wind would come along and, and clean them off and we'd get more, more energy. So we like to take these, these um, deck panoramas as they're known periodically to so, sort of see how we're doing in terms of, of dust. Um, this is a picture taken at Caltech in 2019. On the left is Emily Dean. She was a high school student at Lansing um, when the mission was first starting. And she used to just show up at on the fourth floor at Cornell because she was so fascinated by Mars. And she eventually ended up operating the cameras after she graduated from Ithaca College. She was still hanging around um, the mission. And so we put her to work. And um, this, I, I had just had my hip replaced three weeks before this picture was taken. But Dr. Blake said I could go, I could go ahead and fly out there for this um, team meeting, even because I was still on blood thinners and it would be okay. So <laughs> I'm uh, still limping around a little bit. And this is John Proton. He's uh, the other camera operator and he is now working on the Perseverance rover. And he's written some amazing software to make it easier for um, people who aren't computer literate plan observations um, on other planets. And he he got his master of engineering oh, degree oh, oh. in the Cornell um, mechanical and engineering mechanical engineering department about the same time that I got my MEng degree in the computer science project, but I'm I'm about 30 years behind him. <laughs> my education, but we ended up, we're still very good friends. He came and visited. Um, he's moved to California permanently, but um, he lived in Ithaca for many years and we're, we're all still good friends and we still keep in touch. Uh, uh, this is Elena McCartney, the Mars who is she talking about? Uh, somebody who worked on the um, uh, codes. So th this is another picture taken by pan cam, the pan cam cameras actually of itself, a self portrait and the surrounding um, territory uh, near um, uh, in an area called Erebus. And this was actually a cover of the journal Science in 2004. They, they did an issue on spirit and an issue on opportunity. And this was opportunity's um, cover shot. 
which uh, we were very proud proud of this image. And she's so clean at this point. Um, just a note that uh, as we were traveling around Mars on the journey, we had to have a way of talking about what we saw. And so we ended up naming the rocks and various features. And so these are two, these are actually from Spirit. This was the first rock we stopped at. It was uh, named Adirondack. Uh, we would get theme, decide on themes for the name, such as um, uh, vessels of exploration or islands or mountain ranges or rivers or baseball teams or, or uh, things like that. And it's amazing if you give something a name, it's easier to remember it and what it looks like. It's something in categorizing in the human brain. And I, it, was, it was a brilliant idea to name these things. And so then when we talked about the rock, we, we didn't have to say, oh, the one we saw, you know, 300 meters back, you know, and nobody would have a visual image of it. Um, I think this rock over here was named Humphrey, and I, I can't remember why. I don't think it was for Hubert Humphrey. I don't know what, what it was. <clears throat> um, this is a close-up of uh, the panoramic cameras. Uh, they have filters on them. Uh, this was before JPEG images. Like now the, the um, Curiosity and Perseverance use JPEG just like our, our iPhones, or our camera phones do. But we had to um, take three color, like the, make the red, green, and blue images by combining the, the, the colors. So every time we wanted a color image of something, we had to take three pictures and then combine them. And Cornell came up with um, really wonderful software to do that. And the wavelengths of all these filters are for a scientific purpose to determine mineralogy uh, and so forth of, of what we're looking at on Mars. And over here, this is Baby Sojourner. The, the first one was like a technology demonstration that yes, we can land a rover on Mars. And then this is uh, one of the twins, Spirit and Opportunity. And I think um, Opportunity weighs weighed about 400 pounds. And I think Curiosity is, is something like a ton. So there was a big uh, weight gain in future, in future rovers. Um, this is an example of how the filters are used. <clears throat> so this upper picture uh, is some, some dunes at the bottom of a crater. And Jim Bell came up with a way of, of combining the colors in a way that would be a, using the calibration target um, that, by the way, was designed by Bill Nye, <clears throat> and use, use the colors to approximate what the human eye would see on Mars. And we called it approximate true color, but color is sort of a, a relative concept. We're used to what our eyes do, but um, the colors have a different meaning in science. And so sometimes we would do this lower picture, which um, you, you can see much more of the features and contrasts. Uh, it was a way of, we, we used to call it false color, but now I think they call it enhanced color. It's just a way of looking um, at the images from a, a mineralogy or geology point of view. And that's something that our, our pan cam cameras could do. And we took hundreds of thousands, well, hundreds of thousands literally of pictures on Mars and they all had to be processed. So part of our job after the downlink came down was to put these images together. Um, this is Endurance Crater and uh, Opportunity actually went down into the crater and now we're looking looking along the, we're, we're below the rim and we're looking at the mineralogy and this was a really exciting time. And the reason you go down into a crater we don't have an excavator that we can send to Mars. They're too heavy. But meteor, meteors have excavated Mars for us so that if we want to see layers below the surface, we can drive down with our and examine them with our robotic arm. And again, we've got the two different kinds of color, um, the enhanced color on the right to, to better pick out the layers and the mineralogy. 
And this one, um, we actually drove down, this is where we drove down into Endurance Crater. And we named this um, the Burns Formation after the geologist um, Roger Burns, who um, hypothesized that we would find um, minerals on Mars that showed evidence that they were created in the presence of water. And so these little reddish dots are where the robotic um, abrasion tool um, actually dug into the surface and so that we could put a spectrometer on them and, and see what the minerals were made out of. And you can see signs of a struggle here where the, the rover was um, clattering down these rocks and um, we all in the in the film, Goodnight Oppie, you can see where she almost came in contact with a, a giant uh, boulder, which was named Wapme after a Red Sox ball player, I believe, but that, I digress. And let's see if I can get back here. So this is kind of an overview of Opportunity's journey. We landed and made that hole and run in, e in Eagle Crater. And then we went what seemed to be very far away to Endurance Crater, which you were just looking at where we explored um, and, and did find evidence that these minerals were formed in the presence of, of water in the past. And then um, you, you can recall Steve Squires looking at, he has some images from the high rise mission spread out on a table. High rise is a, an orbiter, orbit, orbiter um, at Mars that takes the most stunning pictures of the surface. They're absolutely beautiful. It's run out of the University of Arizona in Tucson. So we spread out this long image on the table and everybody was sort of fantasizing about where we could drive. And we thought, oh, let's let's go for to Victoria Crater. And it seemed so far away. And I think it took us two years to get there. So it's just a little dot here, but when you get to it, it's, it's enormous. And then you see the rest of the journey, there was a little tiny crater, Santa Maria here. There wasn't much to look at here um, in terms of interest for geologists. But then um, we went whole hog all the way to um, Endeavor Crater, which is, it was just such a journey. And then found wonderful evidence of, of clay minerals and so forth along the edge here. And then of course we decided, yep, we're going to go down in and see what the other layers reveal. And we had big plans for the bottom of the crater, but of course that big dust storm hit. And so we ended up right about there in what's called Perseverance Valley. Now this is back at Victoria Crater, the first big one that we went to. And it's just such a beautiful place. When you when you look at these pictures, as a geologist, you would just want to go hiking there with your with your rock hammer and your your magnifying glass. And so we ended up traversing around the edges of this crater and going out on these promontories and getting these wonderful views. And we had to be very careful not to, you know, slip off the edge, drive off the edge. And we 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 were able to test advances in software that the software evolved over the years of the mission uh, so that opportunity and spirit as well could learn to avoid um, danger on their own and travel greater distances without human intervention. Um, but we were very careful going around the, the edge of, of the crater. And this is what the crater looks like um, from a high rise image. There's a little X up here and it's actually obscuring the rover, but you can actually see the rover in that in that high rise image. And you you can see how we would go around these little promontories and then take uh, pictures of these beautiful dunes down in the bottom of the crater. You can see these wind streaks up here. Um, some people were very interested in, and we ended up taking some samples and analyzing the mineralogy of these darker streaks and so forth. And then um, you remember hearing about spirits wheels, uh, what, wheels freezing up and it had to drive backwards. And this is one of the um, fortuitous serendipitous discoveries that by dragging the wheel, it revealed this white sulfate salt 
that was under the surface that we never would have known about if we hadn't had a stuck wheel that was dragging through it. And so it was very exciting. We took these images and, and everybody was really excited, the science team about analyzing analyzing that. And there's a very interesting rock right there that looks kind of volcanic. And that's on the spirit side of the uh, of the um, of the planet. So let's see. So this is the last image um, taken on Spirit. Uh, these were two features we were headed toward named Goddard and Von Braun, but Spirit got stuck in that very fine talc-like sand and was stuck in a way with winter coming with the solar panels tilted away from the sun. And so she is still there. Uh, the spirit memorial uh, site. Um, she's still there, uh, most likely covered with dust. <clears throat> and then this was the last, um, I took a lot of these images, the legacy of pan legacy panorama. We had gone down into, this is into Endurance Craver Crater. We had driven down pan Perseverance Valley. You can see a little tip of the high gain antenna there. And we were looking back up the slope and taking a panorama uh, when the dust storm hit. And then the last image, we used to take images of the sun every day through a solar filter uh, to see you know, how dusty it was to, to estimate how much solar energy we'd have in our solar, in our battery. And I took that last picture during this the dust storm and it came down and it was completely black. And the and the first thing you think of, oh, did I not point it correctly? But yes, it was pointed correctly. And there was just no light. It was a global dust storm that um, the sunlight was just not getting through. And so that was our our last panorama. And so this was um this was actually taken, oh, I think around 2000 five or so. Um, it's a sunset on Mars. It's just a favorite picture. Um, so, so that's it. So I think I can um, stop sharing so we can see if anybody has questions. No questions? Lorraine has... Oh, hi. hi. Unmute yourself, Lorraine. You're muted. Hello, has a question. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to uh, the the music that was played every morning um, during in the film. They talked about and they they we heard the choices of music that was played every morning um, and who chose it and to get to get the crew started and. Um, am I thinking of the right movie? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Elena, you're muted. <laughs> Elaine? There, okay. Ah. Sorry. Um, yeah, the, the wake up songs were really fun. And my yeah. son at the time was, was at MIT and he kept a playlist. I think I could probably get it, but... Um, Mostly they were picked by the engineers at JPL because they would be the first ones to be looking at the downlink. And that's that's when the day would start, when when the the downlink and data comes down from Mars over the deep space network. We look at everything and then decide what we're going to do for the day. And so, yeah, that was really fun. It, that it was, was so really appropriate, fun. you know. All the, I know. All... Yeah, it was so fun. And there were so, <laughs> so many people who have musical knowledge that there was always something that, that some in somebody's mind that, that would come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was fun. John, you had a question? John Costello? You're muted, John. Is there any chance there'll be a big windstorm and clear off the dust? Yes, that happened a number of times. Um, in... We had a, a very serious dust storm. I can't remember what year it was now, but Opportunity was in a crater and everything got dusty and including the camera lenses. And we were just running on very low power. So a, a dust devil came along 
and and swept it off and and cleaned it off again but we for years we still had dust at the edges of all the pan cam images but jonathan joseph at cornell came up with a um a dust removing method to to post process the images so that we wouldn't so that when we made a panorama out of all those little postage stamps glued together um, there wouldn't be stripes in it of dust at the edge of each photo. Mm. So yeah, the wind was a wonderful uh, blessing for for um, uh, cleaning the dust off. Barbara? I'm amazed that, that the opportunity and uh, the other one <laughs> uh, right. could navigate these the terrain. The terrain. Yeah. Yeah, we we tried to avoid places that were too rocky. And so we had these navigation cameras and hazard cameras also mounted on the rover. The hazard cameras front and rear were underneath the belly of the rover uh, to look look for hazards. The um, the nav cams, as they were known, navigation cameras were up on the mast um, right beside the panoramic cameras and they would do a survey. And then when the survey came down, we would decide based on the hazards in that image, um, how, how to adjust the drive. And also in the movie, it mentioned, you know, we were concerned about slope, driving on slopes down into craters. And so there's this um, Mars yard, it's called at, at Jet Propulsion Lab, where they have a, a, a model rover that has the same suspension system and wheels, and they would test things uh, on at the Mars yard before trying to drive on uh, on Mars and also software over the years developed so that that the rovers became better at, at picking out hazards and driving around them. Mm -hmm. We got stuck in dunes a few times. That was a, always a challenge. So. Any other questions? Elena, I don't know if I misunderstood this when I watched the documentary or not, but the dust storm that basically took out Oppie in the end, did that actually last for six months? Because I, I remember they said they waited months and months and months to see if Oppie would um, communicate again. No, I, I don't think it lasted for six months. I'm not sure exactly how long it did last, but they were hoping that after it stopped, maybe there'd be some wind and the solar panels would, would clean off. And they were, the hope was that the battery had not gotten so low that it could never come back. Uh, mm -hmm. They thought that, you know, after the sun came out, give it some time, maybe the battery will recharge. And it has a, a built-in um, clock that if it has energy, it will it will do something, it will send a signal. And so that they timed their, their watch to, uh, um, to see if a signal would come. You know, not a lot of data, but just any kind of signal, like I'm alive. Right, 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 but, thanks. Yeah. Wait, wait. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please go ahead. No, no, I had to unmute okay. it again, go ahead. May I ask a question? <laughs> yeah. This is uh, Deb's husband, Tim. Um, to, could you talk, uh, briefly about the current rovers on Mars and to what extent are they building on the prior findings and to what extent are they striking out, so to speak, on totally different directions? Yeah, so um, curiosity and perseverance are going strong on Mars. Um, they mentioned curiosity, they mentioned perseverance, but they didn't mention curiosity at the end of the movie. I was kind of surprised because uh, perseverance and curiosity are, are sort of twins as well. They're they're big SUV sized rovers. <clears throat> so Perseverance is now um, drilling samples out of the surface of Mars and depositing them uh, to be picked up by a later mission. Uh, and these samples will be brought back to Earth for an analysis in more sophisticated labs. We can only send so much instrumentation uh, to Mars. Um, so Perseverance is going strong. Curiosity is going strong, uh, still exploring Gale Crater, uh, still 
finding uh, signs of previous water. And yeah, those missions are, are going on uh, to this day. Thank you. Yep. Can, can you say more about the group dynamics? You described um, the whole team as, as being like a family. Uh, but I'm interested in, in sort of how you interacted uh, with people scattered around the world. It's, it's so interesting because for, for years, like lots of times people at JPL, um, at Jet Propulsion Lab, engineers, they move on to other missions and new engineers come in and it became kind of a training ground. And so we knew many people only by their voices and you get really good at knowing who, who's talking and you even kind of know what they're going to say just by their voice. And you haven't really, we didn't have Zoom, so we didn't see these people. Um, and it's the same with, um, like we met the scientists from all over the world the first three, three months of the mission, but we had, and we would have, meetings once a year where we would all get together but most of the time it was through our voices that we would get together um so but we we knew each other really well in that way and sometimes you'd meet somebody and say oh i didn't know you looked like that <laughs> um but it was the i think there was a time pressure that we knew we knew we had to get certain things done in a certain time time frame and then everyone is always excited every day when the downlink is going to come down because we we're going to see something we've never that's never been seen before. We're in a new place. We're in new surroundings. It may only be 100 meters away from where we were before, but there's a new rock in front of us. And it's sort of that excitement of discovery. And then so the way the day would go, you know, we'd have that hour SOW uh, science operations working group meeting where we decide what we were going to do. And then those of us on the camera team and engineering would then have, we'd have headsets on, we'd be going all day, um, putting the command load together that, that would go up at the end of our shift. But after the science meeting, the scientists would go off and talk, they would have meetings about what they had discovered scientifically and what that meant and where what we should look for in in the um, in this or in the next drive, you know, or, or where we should explore next. But then at the next morning's SOWG meeting, the scientists would present what they had found that previous afternoon. So the engineers and the camera people were able to stay in the loop and share that sense of of discovery. And so it just kept rolling along, you know, day after day, month after month, year after year of getting new knowledge like that. Did some of the people from the team that you were on stay on for the switch to the new rovers? Absolutely. It's kind of a small core of people who explore Mars and they, <laughs> they, bring, they bring previous knowledge with them you know, that kind of saves a lot of time, you, you know, you yeah. kind of know what to look for. So yeah, the, in terms of the science team, it's, um, it, it's always the same people. And I know that, um, you know, I'm retired now, but the people I worked with on the camera team, they're still taking pictures, mm -hmm. except for Emily, she's got two babies. So she's, she's kind of semi retired right now. But, but yeah, it's, it's the same people. Yeah. Elena? I wondered if the technology has changed over the years to make uh, it possible for more remote interactions with the project, uh, rather than, I know, understand that everybody is there together at JPL, but now can any of this work be done um, with a direct feeds to other locations, such as here in Ithaca? Absolutely. Um, I think we we really pioneered that back in the early um, 2000s, because after the first three months of the mission, we all had to go back to our home institutions. And so we started using yeah. something called WebEx. And there would be different rooms at, at like there was a conference room at Cornell, which had some kind of camera that projected onto a screen at JPL. 
and um, we did, but we didn't have, you know, sophistic as sophisticated software as we do now. But it's possible mm -hmm. to work anywhere in the world and work on a space mission. And I, most of the years that I worked on Opportunity and Spirit. I'm sitting right where I'm sitting now in my living room, looking out at the lake. Um, you know, it was the best of both worlds. I could be on Mars and be in Ithaca at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, and I, the software has become much more sophisticated. Um, John, Pro, John Proton, who was in that picture um, at Caltech, Cornell, former Cornell student, he wrote software that enabled people anyone with a laptop anywhere can plan um, rover activities uh, because the software helps with the geometry and and uh, and and seeing where we've been and constantly updating information and and adding new pictures to the map and so we're sort of mapping as we go along so yeah there's been a lot of progress in that area and John. <laughs> yeah, right. hi. Um, the thought occurred to me that uh, you're taking pictures and you're moving these things around, and it shows a hazard of some sort that you need to avoid. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to, for this signal to come from the camera to Earth and your correction or response to it to get back? In other words, I mean, if the thing were moving several feet, a minute. Mm -hmm. and it took uh, twenty minutes to send yeah. the signal back and we, forth. We get the point. Uh, you know, it it could uh, yeah. approach the hazard before you have time to respond to it. That's a very good question, and and it points out that we're not really um, what they call joy joysticking the rovers. In other words, we send a command load up. If the rover senses a hazard that we haven't seen, it's just going to stop and then send that down link. And then, you know, we respond to that and um, and deal with it the next day. Uh, so we, especially at the beginning of the rover, we had to be very careful about how far we asked it to drive and how, how well we could see what we were going to. And then the software, it was called software called Aegis was developed um, maybe about five years into the mission that was hazard avoidance, kind of like self-driving cars um, being tested on Mars. That's why I'm a little weary of um, self-driving cars because I know how difficult it is to, to avoid hazards and the ones on Mars were holding still, they weren't moving. Um, so we got, a, we got a little more courage about driving greater distances like 200 meters, <laughs> that is a great distance. Um, but that's a very good question. And, and the data, you know, the signal from Mars uh, varies depending on where we are and where Mars is in relation to uh, our trips around the sun. And it can be anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes for the signal. And as you said, that would be too long to respond. So we just, you know, we would take it, it 20, 24 hour, 39 minute turnaround um, to respond to something like that. Good question. Any others? Marsha. Uh, a silly question, really. Um, in the film, there were a lot of internal shots of the group and people working and, and things going on, but they didn't know they were going to make a film at the end. So under what circumstances were those internal working shots for what purpose were they being shot I think, as a yeah i think um i think probably steve squires had a lot to do with that he's he's a very visual person and his brother tim squires happens to be um ang lee's main film editor he, he and he also edited the Hulk and various um, famous films. So there's, a, you know, a cinema. I, when we were planning the mission, um, Steve 
had um, Dan Moss and some other people do a simulation and he very, very movie oriented. So I imagine it was just there were people had permission to make film, you know, make films and those that footage was was kept. And then there was plenty to work with to, uh, you know, to make a movie at the end. I, I think that was probably in the back of his mind at some point. It, there's very little mention of Cornell, if any, in the movie. That's right. It's it's very. It was made at Jet Propulsion Lab, and as I said at the beginning, it's very um, engineering centric, and it didn't really um, address the the distributed science team that was really the heart of the mission. Um, not the heart of the hardware, but the heart of the purpose of the mission was this um, globally distributed science team that was trying to figure out uh, life in the universe <laughs> by looking so at Mars. Who, who made the decisions, those decisions about the movie? Probably, um, I'm sure Steve Squires was involved, but I, I don't know. I don't know who ran the project. But I didn't. I didn't see Jim Bell there either, and he was very important in the project. So that's a different movie. <laughs> Wendy, Wendy, Wendy. Yeah. hey, hey. Lena, thank you so much. It's so interesting and exciting, and wow, to see what an impact you have had on this discovery. Love it. How were your insights received by this huge scientific community? I mean, you saw a lot with your cameras. Um, could you share input or were there kind of, um, I don't know, were there levels of, you know, um, when you when you needed, because you were at a different level, you, you weren't as respected? I'm just wondering. Oh, that's such a great question because this this mission was an example of just getting rid of that hierarchy. When okay. you have a situation where um, there are, you know, in a in a science mission or space mission, there are always single points of failure. There there are ways you can break things. There are things that can go wrong, and everyone's voice was respected. It was that whole. I just really loved working and even though it was such a huge group of people everyone had a different expertise and every voice was listened to and if somebody wanted a picture of something they you know you had to take into account well the rover's going to be casting a shadow on it or that sort of thing and so everybody had had their input and everyone's expertise was respected it wasn't like working for say in industry where there's a competitive hoarding of knowledge that kind of thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just the opposite where there's um an exuberant sharing of knowledge and a welcoming of of additional input so that's a, a good question thank you barbara what was your training for this mission oh this is really this is pretty funny well um i i was an english major and I made my living for many years typing technical and mathematical papers for professors at Cornell and on my IBM Selectric. <laughs> and then word processors were invented and I did, couldn't afford one. So I started working at Cornell so I could, you know, I worked at mechanical and aerospace engineering and I was still basically a typist but I began to understand what I was typing and uh, being able to correct people's papers. And some mentors at Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering decided to help me get into the employee degree program. And it had to be something job related. And so computer science was upstairs in, in um, Upson Hall. So I decided I'd go for computer science, but I had to like start at CS 101, I mean, you know, and take take one course at a time. And I was a, a single parent at the time, and I don't recommend this path for anybody. 
but by the time I got my master of engineering degree, I saw this ad in uh, the Chronicle or someplace for space sciences. And I thought, wow, holy mackerel, I think I might be, I might be qualified for that. And I didn't get it the first, I didn't get the job the first time they hired a guy who had some space experience. He lasted with Steve Squires for two weeks. And Steve called me back and said, would you like, would you like the job? And at the time I was in the, um, in the hangar at NASA Glenn flying KC-135 vomit comet flights with Michelle Luge's experiment um, in mechanical and aerospace engineering. So they call me into the hangar and say, you have a phone call and it's Steve Squires. And he said, do you want the job? And I said, yes, I'll take it. And so um, I ended up, so I, I had taken robot vision and a bunch of computer science courses. And um, that's how I got the job. And he started me out it wasn't on the Mars mission yet. It was the near mission. And he said, okay, I just started the work, the job. He says, okay, in two weeks, I want you to go to Goddard Space Flight Center and give a talk on mapping spectrometer data onto an irregular asteroid, which happened to be the, the Eros asteroid from the near mission. So I said, okay, and locked myself in a, in a room with my high school geometry book and figured out how to do it. And and then this, this he said, well, how would you like to work on a Mars mission? Okay. So I, my office was right across the hall from him. So then it, it just went from there. It was just a lot of mentors and wonderful opportunities at Cornell. Wow. <laughs> Quite a journey. You know, when You're students ask me about a, a career path, I said, you know, don't, don't take my career path. It's, it might Clearly not be. Clearly you were met. Elena, clearly you were meant to work on opportunity from what you just said. So. <laughs> yeah, right. It was an opportunity for sure. Yeah. I have another question. It may be an unfair question, but could you speculate or speak to the future of space exploration? I'm thinking in terms of disputes within NASA about the relative distribution of resources of manned versus unmanned projects. And now, obviously, you've got the private sector actively involved in space to some degree, and therefore the question of whether this should be the private sector or NASA um, mm -hmm. taking the lead on these projects. Yeah, I think I think the private sector and NASA can can be very good partners. I, I really personally feel we're not really ready for much manned or human you know space exploration. I think robots are, are much better at it. But and also the fact that, for instance, we can't take all this laboratory equipment with us as far as exploration is concerned. And so we have the Perseverance um, mission, which is planning on bringing um, samples back. Um, I'd, I'd like to see more cooperation among different countries. I think that's always a, a level where uh, countries can get along and, and do wonderful mm -hmm. things. Um, but but yeah, I, I don't I don't really have an insight about where we're going from here. I know this the space station is about done and um, we'll see what happens. Good question. Alan? Unmute? Yeah. Um, oh. I came across this book um, a few years ago and found it oh. very charming. Oops, I guess you can't see it. Sojourner. Yeah. Sojourner. It's, yeah. It's titled the uh, Mars Pathfinder rover. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of discussion of driving, for example, on Mars. Still, that was a challenge. Yes. At that time. And I, I don't know, I mean, obviously the science was far, far be behind, but it, uh, I don't know yeah. how much the operational things kind of got inherited. Oh, definitely. I mean, the landing system with the bouncing airbags, that was from Sojourner. And, and it, I mean, what a wonderful way to land. It's just ingenious. But then by the time we got to Curiosity and Perseverance, they were much too heavy. They were, you know, to, to bounce onto the surface. And so they came up with this Rube Goldberg kind of sky crane thing, which, which landed those rovers. Um, but yeah, there, that was the purpose of Sojourner was, uh, you know, technology proving and, and that's what it did. And, and we really built on that, the more sophisticated cameras and, and better, better ability to rove.
Any other questions? Thank well, you so coming. much. Yeah, we're getting near the end. My pleasure. It's it's fun to relive it. <laughs> yeah. And I put some links on uh, on our village talk. Um, Jim Bell, you know, left Cornell and and went to um, Arizona State, and he has maintained a PanCam website there, and all the images are there, and it's really uh, it's really fun, at least for me, to to browse through all the images for both spirit and opportunity. They're sort of time ordered with the most recent ones for, or, yeah, most recent ones first. Um, so I, I highly recommend just looking at pretty pictures. It's very inspiring. Oh, Elena, we thank you so much. So much it, yes. Such a pleasure. So yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome. <laughs> My pleasure. And, and it was a way also to remind ourselves about the level of talent that um, that loves living at home members have. So we will be calling on all of you for your expertise <laughs> before too long. You have you have uh, charted a path for us. Oh, so good. thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we need to chat just a minute about uh, film fest. Uh, Deb, do you want to? say something about Mississippi burning? Oh, yeah, thanks. So um, uh, the I, I'm the co-moderator for the history discussion group, and we're meeting a little earlier than we planned on. We're going to meet on January 31st. So um, to um, honor Black History Month, we're going to be talking about the Freedom Riders um, and the Freedom Ride and the civil rights drive that was going on in the South in the very early 60s. And I suggested to Film Fest that maybe our February um, film could be along the same lines of thinking about Black History Month, Mississippi Burning, which was kind of a, a loose depiction of um, three, three young men who are volunteers who were killed in Mississippi um, working on a voter registration drive, one of whom was a Cornell student. And if you go to Sage Chapel, there's actually a stained glass window in there um, commemorating these three mm -hmm. young men. And that's going to be part of our history discussion group. Uh, and so I just suggested that maybe we could piggyback on with Film Fest and um, do a film that was also kind of in conjunction with, uh, with, with that. Great. So yeah. that will be February 27th, but we'll I'll advertise for everybody. Yeah, and if anyone's interested in coming to the history discussion group, um, also in Village Talk, there's a, a link to a documentary, a PBS documentary um, on the Freedom Riders, and I put some other links up there as well, so you can go in and either follow the history discussion group or just visit the group, and I think you'll be able to see the, the links that way, and you're certainly welcome to attend that discussion via Zoom as well, and that'll be on the 31st at 4.30. Okay. We're set. So we wish you all a good evening. Bye. Thank, thanks for coming. Thank you very much. We we enjoyed Thanks, hosting. Elena. Elena, it was wonderful. Yes. You've done good. <laughs> but then we knew you were, so. <laughs>